Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to come out and speak. I'm going to talk with Andrew and with Austin about what started as a conversation over lunch about how we could create a more positive impact on the building industry. And, you know, our focus went to renewable and sustainable materials. And from there, you know, we looked at what was being done around the U.S. and in educational and in design studios and those kind of circles and how we could contribute and what came out of it is this tall timber study in Los Angeles. Here's some important AIA course information that you should know. This is a quick description. That's what you see she said. And four objectives. Ready, go. Okay. So I don't want to take us all the way back to the beginning, but let's talk about a large part of what goes into wood buildings. A large part of what goes into wood buildings, typically residential buildings, are these engineered lumber joists. And you've got a joist every 16 inches on center that's put into place, and between those joists, there's plywood. And plywood spans and creates your floor. So you have this system of flooring that's going over a wall that's constructed out of 16, in, 16 inches on center sawn lumber studs, and it's got a top plate and a bottom plate. And this is how wood has been done for years and years and years, and is still being done years and years and years in the future. What we found with this type of system is it's it's great, but it's labor intensive. I mean, there's a lot of pieces that are shipped out and they're brought into place individually, constructed in the field. You need a lot of space to lay these down. So, um, you know, the industry is trending itself towards a little bit more of a prefabricated approach. This is a nail laminated timber panel, not a new technology by any means. I mean, you can look at, um, you know, buildings in Chicago or Minneapolis or Oregon where they have these mass timber, uh, I guess you'd call it a construction or, or planks that are built in place as well, um, but they look just like this. What it is, it's a sawn lumber joist on its end, interconnected with screws. And, you know, the modern interpretation of this or the modern flip on this is that you're using this in a prefabricated way. You're looking at a whole building system and you're figuring out how to use planks that you ship out into the site and deliver it on time so you're reducing the amount of space you have on the ground that's necessary for construction equipment. You just drive a truck up and you crane what you need into place. And this is happening today. This is a T3 building in Minneapolis. This is a picture of it during construction. Uh, it is currently completed. It's the largest timber building in the U.S., not necessarily by height, but by, by square foot area. It's 250, uh, roughly 250,000 square feet. It's seven stories tall. And it's built the same way. It's just planned out. So you look at the floor plan and through um, BIM and pre-planning, you can identify which panels go where and at what time you need them and when are you moving these panels into your construction sequence in the shop and when do they come out into the field. <clears throat> Craned into place, this happens to be a concrete core building and it's got surrounding that concrete core, glue lamb columns, glue lamb beams, and on top of all those members is once your framework of glue lamb beams and columns is constructed, you drop these panels in eight foot uh, wide by roughly 40 feet long, so they go in pretty quick. And the result is beautiful. I mean, you see the warm feeling, the warm character of the wood exposed. Uh, it, it's very natural, very inviting, and I think that's why, you know, one of the reasons that the developer chose to use wood. But I mean, don't shy away from the fact that it is faster, and it, you know, you can get higher rents for buildings that appear this way. So there's all all of those metrics working together. Nail laminated timber, again, with the amount of pre-planning required that you're prefabricating these and bringing them out to site, you can take it up a notch and you can plan where your electrical conduits are. So you can actually build into your um, shop schedule that you leave out these routings. The bottom of these planks will be cut out or left away so that you can run conduit. And into the field, after all the conduits been pulled and all the uh, J boxes left in place, you can cover it all up with veneer lumber. And what you have is, you know, really just a repetition of the same language you're seeing in the rest of the nail laminated, laminated timber panels. Just a little bit of extra pre-planning, but a good way to put a really clean finish on these products. And they're not just for boxes. I mean, nail, nail laminated timber, you know, I showed you the example that it's all straightforward and it becomes a really ex long extruded rectangle, but you can step them vertically so you can create a curve. You can step them torsionally against each other so you can create a wave shape. And that's one example of how that can be done. 
So I mentioned that nail laminated timber is an old technology being used in a, in a newer way or, or maybe a, a modern way to leverage prefabrication. Cross laminated timber is relatively new compared to nail laminated timber. Cross laminated timber is plywood on steroids. You're looking at um, layers of two by four or two by six lumber that's laid orthogonally to each other. So each layer is going in the opposite direction, which gives you in-plane strength and axial force um, resistance in two directions. So you've got, instead of nail laminated timber, which is essentially a one-way material, you've got your strong axis going one way. These panels are created so that you have a strong axis in two dimensions, and it just really increases the amount of uses. You can use this now as walls that resist shear forces. You can use it as a diaphragm that resists shear forces. You can use it as a two-way span. So, you know, the nail laminated timber tends to go, let's see, from beam to beam. You have to put up this network of beams so that you can lay these planks on top. Essentially, it's just really thick plywood. But if you look at the cross laminated timber, because it has strength and stiffness in two directions, you can really just point support it and you can make it act more like a concrete slab. You've got the slab working in two directions at one time. You're not restricted to using beams. These panels are currently fabricated in the US uh, up to 10 feet wide and up to 60 feet long. In Europe, they're fabricating these panels 15 to 18 feet wide and just as long. So you're looking at an incredible amount of floor area erected at one time and you know they're they're flown up with inserts and they can span because they have that two-way capacity. In North America, we currently have four or five certified uh, manufacturers of cross-laminated timber with more coming online every day. And if you look at a, an example of how these cross-laminated timber panels can be used, this is a really compartmental or really cellular building type. So you see that uh, the wood floors and the wood walls have all been put up. And again, it's pre-planned. You know where each wall is going beforehand. It's trucked out to site, it's craned into place, and then you put the floors on top and over and over until you're 12 stories tall. This is a building in London that was done this way. And this is just a really nice cutaway isometric of what that construction looks like. Just built it from the ground up and again, relatively fast because you're erecting so much wall and so much floor at one time. You're not building it stick by stick by stick. This is just another example of mass timber, I would say. It's a uh, laminated veneer lumber, looks something like the uh, mass plywood panel we have here. We just have layers of wood shavings oriented in different ways, and this also gives it a two-directional stiffness, but much thinner. And you know, a structure like this comes with a lot of pre-planning. You know, each piece is known and computer generated and in the shop uh, in the Construction sequence, shop drawings are generated and fabricated based on those and then, again, erected piece by piece. I, I always think of this as like the dinosaur model you got from the museum where you just take it and you put the spines on, you put the rib cage on, and that's exactly what this mass timber construction sequence can look like, piece by piece by piece. So again, I'm the structural guy. I'd like to just introduce the material, give a little bit of backstory, but I'll hand it over to our architect, Andrew, to talk about a little bit more current practice and intro to our study. Hey, I'm Andy. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you coming. So um, I'm from Perkins and Will Architects, and we actually have um, a decent portfolio of mass timber buildings, and a lot of them were pretty groundbreaking projects for various reasons. Hey, Austin. And uh, so this is actually the biggest one we've done. This is at uh, University of British Columbia. And um, a few innovative things about it were the can fully cantilevered stair uh, out of mass timber. And uh, what was interesting about this project, actually, was that the contractor was so unsure that they could make the mass timber pencil out. They made us as the designer carry both a concrete scheme and a wood scheme through the whole design process. And then through a grant from the Ministry of uh, Canada, they were able to get a million bucks to go, excuse me, with the wood option. But even then, they only built half of the building out of mass timber, uh, and then the back half was concrete. So it was a really interesting kind of political um, project for us, trying to figure out how can you convince everybody that this is worth doing for a cost and schedule? And uh, Austin will share a little bit from our study how we, we think even in Southern California where we, don't, where we have to ship the material down, you could still demonstrate cost and schedule uh, benefit. So um, 
And like Matt mentioned, it's not always these boxy buildings. I think we tend to think of uh, products like this turning into buildings like that, but it doesn't have to be. I think one of our most expressive projects uh, was the Van Dusen Botanical Gardens, also in British Columbia. And, um, you know, achieving complex curves like this, it, you know, it's a hyperbolic paraboloids and all that kind of math to figure it out, but it's, it's not impossible. And if you have the design vision to do it, you definitely can pull it off, especially with nail laminated timber where each of the wood joists can be rotated slightly relative to the one adjacent. So um, don't think of curves as off the table, but they probably will be limited to walls and roofs. Uh, hard to imagine a floor being curved and uh, conducive to walking on. So um, another example of a train station we did with nail laminated timber roof and curved beams. Um, over time, we've learned to maximize the prefabrication benefits like Matt talked about. Uh, so in this instance, another train station uh, where we prefabricate all the curved nail laminated timber panels, which are bounded on their edges. I don't know if you can see the white wavy line by channels, steel channels that are kind of encapsulating the wood. And then the steel is what carries like a beam from post to post. So drilling down even further into prefabrication, we've looked at modular mass timber buildings. And this is for a project. We actually fabricated a single module, but it was for a 300 unit, um, basically uh, housing for oil workers in Northern Canada. And this uh, project may go through, we don't know yet, but basically find, drilling down to this level of trying to maximize the benefit of prefabrication with mass timber. Um, we found that there was great benefit in this climate because the timber has uh, great thermal values. So you end up using your structure not only for load bearing, um, but also for thermal properties. Uh, so again, on the curvature piece, um, we've, we've delved a little bit into fabricating uh, when we've found that our contractors aren't interested in our design because they think it's too hard to fabricate. We've done um, case studies to illustrate, no, you actually can do this. So this pavilion uh, is being built also in British Columbia. We have an office up there and uh, they love to use wood. So that's why all the references to Canada. But this pavilion, if you see the little pink triangle, it's actually doubly curved and it looks like it's singly curved in the, the images above, but it does have curvature in both directions. So we assume that you can chop it up into a nail laminated timber system. And then we just extract all of those pieces using Rhino. Everybody's done this kind of work in school. Uh, and then we took it to um, Autodesk Build Space, which is a fabrication shop. It's very large. They have a whole bunch of robots, a whole bunch of machinery in Boston. And they, we have an open door to go use their equipment. So we uh, fabricated an instance of this panel over there to prove to the contractor how, how it can be done. So basically, we just nailed it up, milled it down, and there you go. But uh, that, a lot of this left us a little unsatisfied uh, because we kind of get more and more granular and more and more, um, I don't know, problem solving about things that are so project specific that we may be losing a little bit of our ambition on what wood can do. So we took a step back and um, on, a pro on a real project, we reimagined our client's vision of I think a 30 and a 50 story building and said, what if we did it an 80 story building and we did it with wood instead of steel? So this is in Chicago. And um, the client didn't ask for this. They are not planning to build this, but it was an opportunity for us to just think big. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm flipping too fast. So a lot of it's unresolved, but we did actually fabricate a piece of this um, also at build space. So one of the nodes um, has the cross laminated timber floor dying into the diagrid structure. And we made a few of these just to demonstrate um, how the pieces come together. And also we worked with Thornton Tomasetti to prove the, the structural validity of it. So this would actually be on one of the higher floors. This is to scale, but it's uh, with relatively low loads. Toward the bottom of the building, it'd get really beefy. So um, that brings us to this project. So we, we've looked at kind of a real projects from kind of medium scale down to really nitty gritty and then really big. And we said, okay, 
But what about Los Angeles? Can we actually demonstrate that you could build a tall wood building in LA and convince LADBS that they should approve it and let you build it? And how do you get a contractor to agree to this when no one's ever done it here? And even in the cases where they have done it, it's been more expensive than the alternatives of steel and concrete. So that's, that was kind of our ambition when Matt and I originally set out and we involved a fire engineering group, Holmes Fire, uh, to look at this with us. And after we overcame some of the technical hurdles, um, we brought in uh, Austin from Hathaway Dinwiddie to look at the cost and schedule impacts. So um, like this says up here, we had a few goals. One was just to prove to ourselves that we could do it, that we could overcome the challenges. One was to get kind of momentum in the LA community around this issue. And, um, and then also, not, not only the idea of mass timber as a building element for Los Angeles, but prove the code story. What is the story? How can you introduce this in a place, in, into the code that says you can't? So how do you overcome that? So um, first, our first step in the project was to look at uh, John Martin Associates Structural Engineers inventory of buildings in SoCal that we thought would be compare that we could do a comparison between a building in some other material and reimagine it using wood. So we found this project, it's Museum Tower, it's on Grand and what? Grand and Second. It's like a it's a, basically a, uh, across from Colburn School, music school if you know where that is, or Walton Disney Concert Hall. It's right up there on the top of the hill. And this is a flat slab concrete building, so it's concrete columns and beams. Uh, ladder, the lateral resisting uh, frame is moment frame concrete, and it has flat slabs that are only eight inches thick. And if you can believe it, the floor to floor height is eight feet eight inches. So an eight inch thick slab, an eight foot floor to floor, they actually painted the ceiling to give an eight foot clear height which is just really ridiculous. You'd never build a building like this nowadays under any circumstances, the market wouldn't support it. But that's what they did. And we said, okay, they did this extreme thing in 1990 or 89. And can we get there and make it better using wood? Can we even compete with a floor to floor like that and yet make it a more livable space? <coughs> so um, we actually had to redo all the layouts, which is you know, not that big of a deal was partly because we needed a new column grid that was conducive to the size of cross-laminated timber panels. And since we were accepting the extremely low floor-to-floor -floor height, we couldn't have beams, so we were taking advantage of the cross-laminated timber's ability to span in two directions, like concrete. And we just stacked, you'll see, you'll see more images later, but um, we stacked the, uh, actually it's Hard to see in this image, but you see there's no beams, and it's because we're stacking the CLT right on top of the columns. There's a pocket in the CLT, and the, um, the column slips right through, but the pocket is slightly smaller than the columns. So anyway, going back, um, we also had to figure out a different lateral system because we don't have concrete moment frames in wood buildings. So uh, we, we had a few options, and we eventually settled on uh, bucking-resistant uh, braced frames, and we had to find a place for those. So the plan layout changes. I mean, you can see it's obviously a totally different layout, but the footprint of the building is the same. The number of floors is the same. And we only increased the height by four inches per floor. So the overall building on 20 stories ended up being about five feet taller. So that's how we competed with the geometry of the concrete building. Uh, let's see, what else? And then wh one thing that we wanted to figure out was how do you, um, how do you make the structure symbiotic with your other systems? And one, one way we're doing that, so the, the columns support thick slabs, and between thick slabs we have thin slabs. So depending on, I mean in our case, the thin slab wasn't a lot thinner, but even that two inches matters when you're talking about painting the ceiling. So that was a, a benefit we got out of the CLT is there's a place to run your utilities, which is down the corridor and laterally into each unit. So that was a constraint on how we laid the, out the units. And then there are questions around fire, of course, and you know a lot of architectural questions come up. What about acoustics with wood? The wood bounces it a lot, so then you end up having to really dial in and tape all your seams between your walls and your floors. 
and you basically wood's not good with sound. Uh, it surprised me to learn that honestly, but uh, you have to add concrete on top of the wood to deal with the impact sound from people walking in high heels on the floor above. You can't just use a wood slab. You need at least an inch, better to have two and a half inches of concrete topping. But actually in our case, that worked to our benefit because you get metal go into the, this in depth, but we were able to get four times the stiffness of the slab when we use the concrete and the wood compositely. So the concrete is basically in compression, the wood is in tension, and they're acting as a composite beam effectively across the, uh, from column to column. So we, I mean, as you can see, we tried in every way to be synergistic about our approach. Um, and we also accepted the constraint of this boxy concrete building. So it wasn't a flourishy architectural design, but we, we worked within our constraints to solve these problems. So like I said, it's about five feet taller and um, that's the summary of the architecture. Matt, I'll talk more about structure now. So how do you design a building to meet code that doesn't have any codes? Uh, we, we try to use common sense and material science and widely accepted principles of engineering. But you know, again, there's no real clear pathway for us to prove that this building works. And that goes from both like a fire resistance um, standpoint as well as a structural standpoint. There are guides out there, CLT handbook is one, and there's uh, specifications for constructing and approving cross laminated timber panels, and then there's the wood code and eventually the IBC. We'll catch up, but right now, uh, very limited information on how these buildings perform with a lateral system made out of cross laminated timber, and how do you even get the diaphragm to work? I mentioned that you have sure capacity, but that doesn't mean you get to use it in, in the United States. So. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit more about the floor panel layout. So we have the idea that these panels can act more like a two-way concrete slab. And how do we get that to work? I mean, we've got this two-dimensional, or excuse me, bi-directional orthotropic system that we can span between columns and hopefully span some other smaller panels in between. And that's what we did. We took seven ply panels, the thicker panels, and we laid them right on top of two columns and in some cases can't deliver them beyond to pick up a smaller span of thinner panel. And in between those panels, you can see here, these entire bay running up and down the building are thinner panels. So we hope to put some amount of small utility through there, sprinkler, what have you. But in the end, it's just cutting weight where you don't need it and putting strength where you do at the columns. to go. So this is the idea of how these are constructed. We have our base system, whether it's the foundation or the floor below, and once the columns are laid, you put those seven ply CLT panels on top, and then you're infilled with your five ply panels. The two and a half inches of concrete goes on top of everything, and that creates, as Andy said, some stiffness and some sound transmission reduction, and then we were able to put the brace frames on after that. And it's just that simple. It's, it's all vertically. You don't have columns going more than one floor because in that way you can start laying these panels on top of each other and on top of columns and you do one floor at a time and come back and, and build up again. So not having clear guidance on how to design these buildings per code, we looked at the, the guidelines within design manuals that the cross laminated timber ham provides. And so what our first challenge was, we understood that vibration and, and deflection was going to be our probably biggest challenge. So we looked at the effective stiffness of a cross laminated timber panel, which even though it is orthogonal, doesn't behave like a uniform piece of wood. You actually have the layers in between your strong axis. If say you're bending in one direction, those layers in between are, are weaker. They like to roll. You know, wood is like a bundle of straws where the tree was sucking water up from the ground and into the leaves. If you have that bundle of straws, just think about moving that over, all those little round tubes rolling on each other. It's like long ball bearings. And that's exactly the mechanics of a cross laminated timber panel. Luckily for us, there's some really simple equations to uh, represent this, this behavior of these panels as they do deflect under dead live loads. And so we take these simple equations and we transmute them into a spreadsheet. And what we did was we looked at five layers worth of a cross laminated timber panel and we used those equations to generate the effective stiffness. And what we found matches exactly what came out of the um, 
the standards for cross laminated timber panels. So we proved to ourselves that our spreadsheet works. We're, we're able to put these layers together and, and generate the exact same numbers that come out of testing and out of, out of the handbook. But if you look at the bottom table, what we've done is there's a layer on the top, number one, that's two and a half inches of concrete. And so what we've done is we've added this material on top that is admittedly more weight, but uh, much stiffer than wood, much stronger than wood. And it's just like using concrete over a metal deck in a steel building. What you're doing is you're engaging the two materials together. You're taking advantage of the compressive strength of concrete and you're using that to increase the strength of your total member by increasing its depth and having um, tension where wood is strong and then co compression where concrete is strong. The net result is, like Andy said, you get four and a half times more stiffness. And so that really led us towards not only for acoustic reasons having the concrete, but from a lateral standpoint diaphragm as well as a uh, stiffness advantage, we, we put together a concrete composite slab. And we don't go too deep into the details in our, in our study, but the way this is done is you can, you know, create a field of nails on top of your wood panels and cast the concrete on top of that. And you essentially have a whole bunch of dowels engaging the concrete and the wood together. You can use perforated panels that are sliced and epoxied into the wood panels so that the concrete engages the, the steel plate. And from there, you, you marry the two materials together. And there's a lot of testing and study going on on ex exactly how that works right now. So that the codes to design this um, in good detail can be developed. So with four times stiffer of a floor system, we are spanning from column to column 26 feet, which is roughly the same as the spans that are used in the concrete building. So we've got a seven ply CLT panel, which is roughly, I wanna say nine and five eighths inch thick. And this panel plus two and a half inches of concrete, we are looking at our, our floor system. And what I'm showing up here is really the mode of vibration of the floor system. So if you consider people walking in the hallway and how that affects the units, you're looking at how this floor as a whole starts to work together to, to mitigate vibration. You see a lot of the actions in the center where we have the longest span. But if you look at the table on the right, what we've drawn is the curve for perceptibility for vibration based on years and years and years of tests, uh, you know, applied technology council, like old, old data on what people can feel, like what matters. If you're laying down, what kind of footfall and vibration affects you. If you're standing up working in the kitchen and someone's walking, what kind of footfall affects you? And based on all those curves and looking at the frequency of our, our structure, which was between six and 11 hertz, you know, we're less than half of the perceptible range. So we're performing very well. We've got four times stiffer floor than just wood alone, and it's working to our benefit. Over 26 feet, we're seeing vibration that's well within acceptable limits. Again, deflection of our floor was an issue. Uh, wood and concrete both have a phenomenon that is called creep. And over time, under sustained load, both materials were, will continue to deflect. And this is well understood in concrete and wood. The factor of long-term deflection is roughly, roughly um, two inches, or excuse me, two times the, the sustained dead load. But in addition to that phenomenon where we have creep factors, we're also looking at not only the finished structure, but also the sequence of construction. How did we get here? You know, if you look at it, part of the way that we were trying to maintain cost compatibility, competitiveness with the concrete scheme is that we eliminated formwork. You know, if you put up a concrete floor, you have formwork, you layer reinforcing, potentially your post-tensioning, your tendons, and then after you come back and put concrete on top, it cures and you move ahead. With this system, we've got wood planks, and the wood planks are part of our finished system, but they're also leave-in formwork. We're using these planks to support the concrete when it's wet. That also means that we're using that original cross-laminated timber stiffness property to support our initial dead load. And it's not a lot of the dead load, but it's most of it, and it's two and a half inches of concrete. You can see that the wood panels by themselves, we do time-sensitive studies or you know studies of deflection along a timeline that the Initial deflection is about 0.4 inches, and then the concrete cures, the leave-in formwork remains, and then you have a composite system. Any additional dead load that goes onto that slab, flooring, furniture, live load, um, hanging ceiling, what have you, um, the additional dead load is about half of that. You see about 0.2 inches. So even though it's about half the weight, the, the concrete is about half the weight, it generates twice the amount of deflection as normal. Uh, luckily, from the initial onset of deflection, we can engage the composite section to resist that two times creep dead load factor. So we see on top of everything else, the 
point, original 0.4 inches plus two times the 0.2 inches, so we see about an inch of deflection. Over 26 feet, I mean, that's, that's not really that noticeable, and it's well within code limits of uh, the span over 240, which is 1.3, so about 75% of what would be a maximum load deflection. In our initial, initial research looking at the material and the other studies that have been done and case studies and prototype buildings that have been developed, it was identified that gravity loads and strength of the material generally isn't an issue. And we confirmed that with our study. The panels by themselves, even without considering composite action, the strength of the concrete contributing to the strength of the whole floor system, didn't, wasn't found to be a factor at all. You know, the wood by itself holds itself and the concrete and the flooring and the ceiling. So, the wood, it has more than enough capacity to support everything. <clears throat> now, what we did do, and we'll get into this with the next part of the study, is we considered a couple different load cases when we were considering strength of the floor. We looked at the service condition, which is, you know, your maximum live load and your anticipated dead load. And we looked at the system as it remains. You've got a concrete topping over, you know, nine and five eighths inch worth of wood, seven plies of CLT. But we also looked at a controlling fire condition. What happens if, because we're using the wood as our fire-resistant material, we're using it to, to char and to you know, sacrifice itself to slow the fire and protect the wood that's beyond it? You know, what does that look like? What, what kind of section should we consider and what's that load? You know, luckily, there is guidance in current codes to consider a reduced live load. You don't have to consider that the entire live load is there. You get to use a realistic live load. So from a 1.6 factor down to a 0.5, we reduce our live load, which is a large portion of the load on the panels. And we consider at the same time that two plies of our CLT panel have been consumed by fire. And so we're going from a seven ply panel to a five ply panel five ply panel and that is the controlling case for the strength but even over 26 feet and with the reduced live load those panels can span by themselves without even considering the concrete so just a little bit of a testament to how much strength these materials actually have we approach the gravity column design in the same way two load cases you look at an ultimate case with the 1.6 live load factor your full column size which for our building was at the base gravity column we're looking at 26 inches squared fabricated glue lamb column or composite glue lamb column. But then we also had to consider a fire case. What happens when our column is consumed on all four sides and it shrinks from 26 inches squared to 18? Do we still have enough load carrying capacity to support a reduced load case? And, and we do. You can see the comparison is we're around 64% of capacity for the ultimate load case. But if you look at the fire case, we've jumped up. Not significant and certainly not over 100%, but we're, we've gone from 64 to 75. So definitely a consideration if you're using the wood itself as a fire resistant material in your buildings. We're in Los Angeles, we have earthquakes, so lateral design is a big part of how we approach the building or a big concern. And you know the code and research being what I would say in its still relative infancy, we didn't have a lot of information about how CLT wall panels behave. So as Andy mentioned, we, we elected to go for uh, a better understood system, not necessarily one that's codified because they don't, wood systems combined with buckling restraint braces isn't in the code, but you know, it's well understood. And this is kind of where we're getting into the common sense side of the code. Like, well, it's gonna perform really the same, a couple proof tests and we, we'd be there. So let, let's take that leap of faith and we'll believe that we can use the buckling restraint braces. It's in Los Angeles, it's a tall timber building. Let's use something that's really well understood and really ductile. It's gonna dissipate a lot of energy in an earthquake. And we do have really large earthquakes at the site. The existing site is on Bunker Hill. You know, there's earthquake faults nearby. Uh, we found that we're controlled by um, such a high level of seismic shaking or potential seismic shaking that we're in seismic de design category E, the second most critical in, in all of uh, the United States. But our, our building dissipates so much energy because it's so flexible. We're using that buckling restraint brace that elongates and acts as a fuse between the uh, elastically behaving, I'm trying not to get your eyes rolled back in your head, the, <laughs> the, the wood members themselves. So we're having the brace do all the work and it's, gener it's dissipating so much energy that we're actually lowering our force to levels that we expect to see less force than the code minimum. So in all cases for our buildings, for the timber prototype, we're using code minimum, even though actual physics would have you believe that the force transmitted to these buildings is less. <clears throat> But you know what, what happened? You know, we've taken a building that uh, used to be a concrete building, and we've we've looked at it in wood. How does the reduced mass affect seismic performance? And you know, in Los Angeles, you can almost say with 
with certainty that a concrete building is going to be governed by, by seismic loads because of its weight. But we're at 20 stories and we're looking at a building that weighs half as much. You know, the, the wood material itself weighs about a fifth of the amount of concrete does, but we have the two and a half inches of concrete on top. So as in general, our building is about half the weight only. And so we looked at wind, you know, where, where do we, where do we sit from a pressure standpoint? And we do see high winds, relatively high winds, especially at those heights. And we're ranging between uh, 40, 40 and 66 pounds per square foot. <clears throat> and, you know, we actually found that at 20 stories, our building is roughly rectangular shaped. And if the wind is blowing on the wide face, the wind governs over seismic design, which is not intuitive for Los Angeles. And if you look at the other side where you have a small wind area to blow against, in that case, seismic design, because the weight of the building still overtakes the wind force that's generated by 66 pound per square foot, you know, generated by wind blowing on that building. I mentioned that we wanted to use a ductile, tunable, predictable material as our lateral force resisting element, and we, we found that in timber buckling restrained braces. You know, buckling restrained braces are a well understood material. It's generally a steel core surrounded by grout and encased in a steel tube, and in that way, that outer tube, that casing, restricts the buckling of that steel tendon. So you're, you're engaging what's a normally flat bar that would buckle over such a long length from point to point, you know, column to column over a floor height. You're, you're restraining that, and so you're, you're getting the material full tension and full compression in both directions. So what we tried to do is, again, take a leap of faith. We could use wood to restrain that material. So we imagine that we have a really simple setup, and. We've just put two pieces of glue lamb on the sides of this steel core, and from there we are creating the same mechanism that works for a steel buckling restrained brace. Testing for material like this and assemblies like this is ongoing. You know, uh, not just our office, uh, where we're trying to test a, a more larger system scale, where we're using a steel buckling restrained brace with wood columns and beams, but there are actually people that have put wood casing on steel cores to see, you know, what kind of modifications to our really simple simple approach need to be done so that it actually performs the way that you're looking. You get the full compression and the full tension in both directions. Details are a big deal. We're looking at right now, we have a system where we're laying our wood planks over top of the columns. And when we talk about the frame connection, we've got this steel gusset plate that's interconnecting all these elements, columns from the wall, from the levels below, columns above. We've got uh, beams for the brace frame that connects from column to column. And we also have the braces themselves. So. You know, it's, it's relatively simple, it's one piece, it's these gusset plates, but what you find is that we, we've interrupted the, the CLT panel going through. So all that great work we did to have our panel cantilever over and, and use the natural geometry of our floor framing to advantage um, longer spans with shorter depths, you know, we're, in, we're interrupting it with a, um, a steel plate. So we have worked around that, we find ways to, you know, make sure we have proper bearing on the columns but still work around it so that we can connect all these pieces together so that the brace can find its force and dump that in the columns and so on down the building, down the building. The approach for the frame that we did was, again, using common sense parallel codes. We used the steel code to take buckling restrained brace frame design approaches and we just apply that to wood. We assume that the brace is fully yielded or fully compressed and we apply those expected forces into our, into our bolts for the connections in the gusset plate steel and also into the columns and beams. Bevan's not here, he's in San Francisco, but Andy, you want to take this part over? I'm not a fire engineer, but uh, we did have fire engineers work on this and do um, a computational fluid dynamic modeling to uh, illustrate what would happen if you put this building into a three-hour fire or at least put a couple of the details through a three-hour fire. So the columns in our case uh, need to withstand three hours, the floors two hours. Um, so like Matt said in the case of the floor, um, where we found that we'd lose two layers so for the five-ply pan five panel you're down to three plies and since we, two of those plies, actually this is a good in illustration. So two of the plies, the top and the bottom ply, are going in this direction and one is going in this direction. So even if two layers below that have burned off, you still have two plies going in the direction that you need to resist the uh, dead loads. So um, 
In that case, we were fine, and in the seven ply panel, you lose two and you're down to five, and then you still have three plies out of five that are going in the right direction to resist your um, primary axis loads. So, um, actually, what, what this table here is showing is that fire tests have been done to illustrate that a seven ply panel on the bottom line there can withstand 178 minutes of fire before collapsing. Five ply panel, 86 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they actually last a long time in fire, and you can imagine, you know, after one hour or two hours, a few of the layers burning off, and after a, you know, a few more layers have burned off, it's actually collapsing after two and a half hours for a seven ply panel. So um, we looked at two cases. So one is the small unit, it's like a studio, and then a large unit, it's a two bedroom. So the small unit uh, has a fire load, um, you know, that's basically what's going to be consumed in the unit, plus some of the structure that's going to be burned in a fire. And the large unit has a larger fire load because there's more furniture to burn. So we look at, you know, fire time temperature curves. These are basically standardized curves that tell you how a fire, you know, the intensity of the heat in a fire over time. So if you follow the red line, the solid red line, you get heat, 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 and then it falls off and then has this kind of degradation here off to the right. It's possible with the dashed line, that represents where the furniture has been consumed, and then you also have more fuel, which is the wood of the structure is starting to burn. Once that wood finally ignites, like the big log on the fire, it's able to recontribute and grow the fire again. That's called a flashover point whenever you reach that peak and really get the, actually when the, the fire starts to heat up, the second flashover is when it turns back up on the dashed line. So um, fire tests, millions of fire tests have been done, or many, many tests, and actually Matt and I participated in one last year, five, a series of five tests on a two-story mass timber building. And um, so these curves are pretty reliable, and that's what we feed into, uh, I'm just skipping over a lot of this, that's what we fed into this uh, study that they did, that the fire engineers did, to prove how much wood would burn. So the black is actually the charred wood after the fire event. So you can see this is a section, the top left is a column running vertically and the CLT slab running horizontally. And we lose about four inches around the column, which takes us from, what is it, 22 uh, by 22 square down to 18 by 18? Oh, from 26, but oh, yeah, so it's four inches on each side, roughly. So you lose about eight inches across the whole thing to take us down from 26 inch by 26 inch down to 18 and a half by 18 and a half. That 18 and a half is what actually is governing our design. So we first find that number, then we size it up to accommodate how much fire we expect, how much burn off we expect from the fire for three hours. So the plan drawings on the bottom left show, um, on, the, on the far left, that's with the steel plates running through, and uh, on the right is just the regular section through the column below, kind of halfway up through the column. And actually, this table here shows you that um, the temperature inside the steel actually remains very low, um, and it's because we kept it far, we actually assume that there's dowels. So these two horizontal elements that are kind of like by the A to A, those are the steel bolts that connect the wood column to the, the plate that's running vertically. And we've offset the, uh, the end of the bolts, or we've recessed them in and pocketed it with a dowel, uh, like a wooden dowel. So that wooden dowel actually has to char before the steel can heat up. The point is, we don't want the steel to heat up. We want the steel to be far enough recessed into the wood that it never gets hot. Because if it gets hot, it'll char the column from the inside. So that's what you have to fight against. And if you see here on the right, first we assumed that the, the steel bolts ran all the way from side to side of the column. And you can see uh, like the turquoise color, that's where the inside of the column is starting to char because the steel is bringing the heat in from the edge toward the center. So after we realized that's not working, we switched over and recessed all the bolts and it started to perform better. Um, let's see, what else did I want to cover? Yeah, that's about it. I think the conclusion for us was that the fire analysis by fire experts proved that um, actually the char can be overcome as long as you first figure out how much char will be there. In other words, how much of the members are you losing? Then design 
your structure to add that much additional to what you need structurally. So that's kind of the process to think about. And Austin will now share about cost and schedule. You ready? Sure. Surely. Thanks, Andrew. So, I miss introductions, but I'm Austin Baker with Hathaway Dinwiddie Construction. Uh, we did some, some quick ROM analysis um, comparing the typical concrete structure versus the new hybrid structure and um, came up with some, some rough conclusions that verified uh, the pricing of a CLT uh, solution is, is roughly comparable uh, to that of a typical cast-in-place structure. Um, we used our, our typical model based takeoff um, for each solution um, and, and essentially just, just compared and contrasted where the information was available. Um, as, as our baseline, we're using 2015 um, market conditions to, to set our baseline on the uh, cast in place concrete scheme. Um, we loaded um, those same takeoffs into the, the cost model of VECO platform, which we use for all of our cost estimating. Um, let's see, foundation cast in place versus foundation CLT. So we're showing a, a, slight, um, uh, a slight deduct on the CLT foundations due to uh, reduced overall weight of the structure. Um, let's see, on the superstructure itself, we're showing a slight increase in cost for CLT. Um, some of that has to do with trucking, some of it has to do with uh, manufacturing and fabrication, detailing, etc. cetera. Um, but again, this is based on subcontractor input on the CLT uh, at the time of the study. And then we're showing a slight deduct uh, for the interiors uh, on the CLT solution based on double duty of the CLT and, for example, the soffit conditions and um, columns, et cetera. So you have uh, slightly, uh, a slight advantage, again, on the CLT solution. Um, both, both buildings are coming out to roughly 300 bucks a square foot, um, and then you could extrapolate that extra rental income um, for the three or three to four months, um, based on a, a slightly uh, more expedited uh, construction schedule, um, produce another potential two million dollars in savings on your GRs and GCs, etc. Um, and these quick graphics with the Gantt bars below are just articulating uh, again a, a slight advantage on the um, on the CLT uh, erection sequence. Um, and then it was there a question we just like that slide oh cool um, okay what we're showing here it's it's been a while since I looked closely at this but um, this is called flow line scheduling and it basically uh, takes uh, each of the tasks uh, for each of the tiers of the structure and sequences it out um, so you can see how let's see without reading uh, I guess I have it's a little bit small but it's essentially showing the I want to say all the all the red lines on the right um, are the typical sequence with a um, uh, cast in place structure with your your forming reinforcement and your pore sequence um, compared to the blue lines on the left uh, that show your CLT erection sequence um, followed by your um, your light blue straight line um, being your your pour out of your topping slab um, again on the CLT solution and so the delta between the light blue straight line and the series of of red and pink lines on the right that that's articulating your duration your delta and duration for the overall erection sequence and this details up here uh, because it's really critical uh, to taking that uh, topping slab uh, off the critical path uh, which allows your erection to um, to play out more expeditiously than if you had to wait to pour out each deck before you advance your erection and, and again, that's a critical assumption for achieving your, your duration savings. Uh, 
so some some long-winded conclusions here. Um, Performance-based, code-compliant, high-rise wood building is possible, even in challenging environments such as uh, downtown Los Angeles with all its seismic um, implications. Uh, the wood tower demonstrates competitive performance with the reinforced concrete tower in the following areas, vibration, deflection, lateral force resistance, thermal performance, uh, acoustic performance, and of course, compliance with modern code requirements. Um, and then finally, with the appropriate testing as noted in the report, the mass timber design proposed can meet all code requirements for type 1A building. And, and that's really the, the bulk of the presentation. Asushi. Um, can you explain 